Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Glenn Deason, and I'm joined today by Colonel Douglas McGregor. Uh, welcome, Colonel. Happy to be here, Glenn. I was yeah, hoping today we could talk about uh, all the developments we now have in the Ukraine war, but I really wanted to ask you first about uh, the Middle East as uh, the war is now expanding from merely being in Gaza to now uh, having huge escalations between uh, Lebanon and Israel. And uh, well, I was, it seems almost as if any hopes of avoiding a greater war in the Middle East now well, it seems almost like foolish optimism. Uh, well, hopefully I'm wrong. So I, I was wondering, how do you see the current developments taking place? And uh, well, what is the role of the United States uh, as this war escalates? Well, the role of the United States is to unconditionally support whatever the Israeli government wants to do. And more specifically, Prime Minister Netanyahu. So I think that's our role, <clears throat> like it or not. That's where we stand. I, I think it's important to uh, pause for a second and understand just really where we are now. You talked about escalation. Well, that's very definitely the case. The Israelis have now dramatically escalated their attacks on southern Lebanon. It looks as though these uh, bombing runs are a preparation for a ground assault. And uh, that's that's extremely important because I think the real strategic inflection point will come with the Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon. Now, will that be a full-scale invasion or a series of short raids on the ground over the border? I have no idea. Uh, but I think the ground force is being ready to go in. Now, keep in mind that the reserve ground forces, in other words, those people that are only mobilized uh, in the event of an emergency or war, the reservists are controlling Gaza, the reservists are controlling the West Bank so that the so-called regulars, the core of the Israeli force, are up north. These are the best brigades, the best organizations. And I think they're they're performing reconnaissance on the ground, uh, battalion commanders, brigade commanders, looking at the approaches, where they'll go in and what they'll do. This is very important because, quite frankly, despite the enormous efforts undertaken from the air and with missiles against uh, southern Lebanon, uh, they really haven't succeeded in doing a great deal of damage to Hezbollah. Hezbollah is actually prepared for these assaults. And I think uh, once the Israelis go in on the ground, that will probably be the trigger for Iran to take a greater hand. Thus far, Iran has stayed out of it, kept out of it. Uh, the Iranians know that the uh, Hezbollah fighters are extremely well armed and prepared. But once the Israelis commit on the ground, I think that will be judged as a turning point. Now, what does that mean? Will Iran jump in with both feet 100%? I, I don't know. The other thing is that from the vantage point of the United States, I think the U.S. armed forces are waiting for the ground assault before they actually engage in support of the Israelis. So that's why I think the idea of Israeli ground forces in southern Lebanon is very important. Now, we've had some interesting developments over the last 24 hours beyond just bombings. We now have Israeli aircraft, an F-15, at least one, that has landed in Cyprus because of damage inflicted on Israeli airfields. That's very important because both Hezbollah and Turkey have warned that if the Israelis utilize Cyprus that they will regard that as part of the war zone. The Turks are, of course, extremely sensitive to Cyprus, as you know from the history down there. Uh, they will not be pleased at all that the Israelis are operating out of it. They were already very unhappy with the British use of Cyprus to support uh, strikes uh, in various places, but more important, the uh, air defense operations that the Israelis mounted when they were uh, under threat of attack by Iran. So I think we, we're reaching a strategic inflection point where this war really will go regional. It'll move beyond just uh, Hezbollah in Israel or, or Houthis in Israel, but this could also include Iran and potentially others. At the same time, we should not lose sight of what's going on in Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. Uh, I think that General Sisi's position in Egypt is very, very fragile. The Egyptian population is ready to, to essentially remove him. 
I think we could wake up and discover that the Egyptian army has taking, taken him out of his office. Now, what does this mean? This means that despite our efforts to bribe the Egyptian government into silence and uh, essentially compliance with whatever Israel wants to do, that the situation in Egypt could change dramatically. You have a similar situation in Jordan. King Abdullah's government resigned en masse in front of him. I think King Abdullah is on very shaky ground. There are an estimated 11.2 million Palestinians living in Jordan. They know what has been going on in Gaza. They know what has been happening in the West Bank. Uh, if he is removed, and I think there's a real possibility that that could happen, uh, I think the floodgates will open and the Palestinians in Jordan will join their brethren on the West Bank. How will this unfold? I don't know, but I think it's it's very possible. Remember that we also have somewhere between five and 9,000 American soldiers in Iraq, Syria, and Jordan. I personally, and I think many of us in the military, are very concerned about those soldiers. Uh, they are not in a good position from the standpoint of rescuing them in the event that they come under very direct, sustained attack. We have sustained some losses. We don't know how many are killed or wounded, but there were attacks on our forces in northeast, Levin, or excuse me, northeast uh, Syria, where we continue to control this very small oil installation in Syria. The Syrians are not really the ones involved in this, although I'm sure the Syrians would be happy to see us go, but you're talking about uh, supportive Shiite militias in Iraq and Syria that would like to drive us out. But the danger is that if you have a large number of people wounded, how do you get them out? How do you evacuate them? How do you prevent them from being you know, pulverized uh, into the dust by rocket attacks. I mean, they, they have phalanx guns that are automated on their perimeters, so they can do some damage, but those are not that difficult to take out of action if you're determined to do so. So these are all serious issues that uh, I don't think most Americans are aware of, but the loss of American life in those areas could, could have a big impact. Americans don't know, frankly, how many people we have in the Middle East, how many soldiers are actually on the ground. They haven't paid much attention. In fact, I would argue that that's one of the big problems in U.S. foreign and defense policy, that Americans really don't pay much attention to what happens beyond their borders. So now uh, we're waiting for the next shoe to drop, and that means if the Israelis go in on the ground, we can expect a much larger and more profound, profoundly destructive war than what we've seen to this point. And we haven't seen the various hypersonic missiles and other uh, arsenals of destruction that could be delivered against Israel either. But all of this is calculated, as you know, by Mr. Netanyahu to bring the United States into the war on his side in support of him. That's really what this is all about. Yeah, that was my follow-up question. Uh, what do you think could uh, trigger the United States to enter the war? Because it appears the U.S., well, the U.S. is happy to supply the weapons. I've seen some reports that uh, the U.S. might have been assisting with uh, drones and other intelligence for striking Lebanon, uh, but it looks as if the United States would like to stay uh, more indirectly involved. Uh, but uh, as you pointed out, the Israelis' main plan, much like the Ukrainians, appear to be to pull the Americans in. So what do you think would be the main, well, the possible triggers to pull the United States into a wider Middle Eastern war? Well, I think the big trigger is really invading southern Lebanon on the ground. <clears throat> that is likely to attract uh, Iranian attention, which means the Iranians could then conceivably intervene on the side of Hezbollah. Uh, that in turn would trigger our introduction into the fight. Uh, we would, we would uh, probably jump at the opportunity to unleash everything we've got in those carrier battle groups, as well as the uh, bombers from the continental United States, as well as those that are down in Diego Garcia and places in Europe and hurl them at Iran. Again, this is a very dangerous situation because then uh, you bring in Russia. Russia is not likely to sit there quietly and watch us pulverize uh, Iran. Remember, there are several thousand Russian soldiers, technicians, civilians on the ground in Iran helping the Iranians to build up their air and missile defense capability. 
Now, if this if this occurs, and I would also expect the Israelis to go after uh, the nuclear uh, development facilities inside Iran, or what are alleged to be nuclear development facilities. And again, you have a similar situation with the U.S. military. I'm sure that all the target lists, all the data for targets, the target arrays have been traded back and forth between us and the Israelis. So it's really a matter of flipping a switch and you find yourself in a regional war. Yeah, it's uh, um, it uh, seems to be a conflict which we can't really control anymore. As uh, we discussed earlier, um, the, the time to have resolved this would have been much sooner, but I feel it's gone out of control for all the main parties. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit to uh, the United States, because you currently have a visitor over there now, um, President Zelensky, uh, who has gone to the United States to present uh, what he refers to as the victory plan. Now, there's some uh, lack of clarity about what this plan entails. Uh, it seems to be for the United States to start uh, doing long-range precision strikes into Russia, which uh, Putin has warned would uh, amount to a direct war between the U.S., and Russia, which, uh, yeah, best case scenario might be World War III without nuclear weapons, but of course it could be much worse. So not only this strikes into Russia, but also NATO membership apparently. So it's it's a bit un unclear what the victory package entails. Uh, the main argument is that this is necessary to pressure Russia to sit down and talk. Uh, which is also a bit <laughs> dishonest, it seems, because it was uh, the US and UK that sabotaged the Istanbul Agreement in early to 2022 and also Zelensky passed a law banning negotiations with Russia so it's unclear why uh, why why suddenly it's presented as uh, Russian obstruction uh, being the main problem uh, given that none of the western countries have wanted to have, even have diplomacy with the Russians for the past two and a half years so it uh, it seems yeah, unclear what, what this is uh, supposed to achieve but Given the high stakes, what do you see? What do you think this victory plan entail? And uh, do you think uh, Washington will give him what he wants? It sounds much more like a sustainment plan: how to keep the war going for a few more months, as opposed to victory. <clears throat> because we've had other victory plans submitted in the past. If you go back a year or so, you had this plan for victory. If you can replace all of our losses. And uh, we'll have another major offensive, but you, we need to build a new army. You, you recall this back in 22, 23, 24. We've been down this road before. <clears throat> I don't think this is a victory plan. I think it's just a sustainment plan. How do we keep things going? I, I think that the people in the White House are not enthusiastic about sanctioning long-range precision strikes against targets in Russia. I think they understand the, the consequences and I think they're actually looking for a way to quietly retreat uh, from that position. So I think there's a willingness to provide many more things, including artillery ammunition, uh, replenish uh, vehicles. I understand there's an order for 200 Bradleys now uh, to ship uh, to Ukraine, but I'm very skeptical that they will allow these long range precision strikes. And I think that's a good thing, frankly, because I don't think uh, we really want to go to war with Russia, despite uh, our foolish statements and policy positions. Now, that doesn't mean it still couldn't happen. I mean, I've been wrong before, but I think this this is not likely to be the case. I think there's something else going on, though, that's uh, far more important, and that is that the Europeans themselves want to step back from this. So support for this policy is eroding rapidly. It's very clear that the Germans want nothing more to do with this, despite what uh, uh, Mrs. Baerbock may say or other members of the Schultz government. He's on very shaky ground. Uh, the Russians know this, and I think they would welcome change in the Berlin government, which is probably inevitable at this point. I just don't know how soon. Uh, there may be changes in Paris as well, uh, and changes in other European governments on the model of, say, Slovakia and Hungary. Things are not well in Poland. The Polish population is not at all enthusiastic about being drawn into a war. And more recently, you had this attack up near Tver, 
in uh, northwest Russia. And it's interesting, if you look at the locations that we struck, or when I say we, I'm talking about the Ukrainians, and we don't know where they were launched from. I've heard different theories, uh, something about Latvia having been a base for the launch of these uh, unmanned combat aerial vehicles against uh, uh, this ammunition storage area. But if you look at the radar coverage, our data undoubtedly was provided to the Ukrainians, showing them that they had a good chance of getting in there and inflicting damage without necessarily electrifying or signaling the entire air and missile defense network. Now, how much damage should they do? I don't think it's nearly on the scale that the Ukrainians have to, had hoped for. Uh, and it certainly has not set back Russian uh, munition production uh, they undoubtedly found some Iskander missiles that could be detonated, and that helped to explain the giant fireballs and explosions, along with lots of artillery ammunition. I'm told some of it came from North Korea. Uh, who knows? But uh, the bottom line is it was a flash in the pan, not a game changer by any means. It's not going to slow the Russians down or inhibit what's happening down in Ukraine. And we know that in Ukraine itself, the, the front continues to crumble. And the regime in Kiev is uh, on the verge of collapse. There's no question about that. Uh, and I think the Russians know it. And they're proceeding cautiously, as they have thus far, because they, too, don't want a war with NATO or the United States. So I think if there's any good news in all of this, uh, I think it is that both sides, Washington and Moscow, really don't want to go to war with each other in eastern Ukraine. And the question is, how do you how do you get past the current impasse? In other words, how do you move beyond where we are now? And there, there are undoubtedly debates in Moscow about uh, do we destroy several city blocks in Kiev and then move forces over the river and into Kiev itself? I don't know. Again, I think Mr. Putin has never wanted that. He does not want to govern Western Ukraine. He would like Western Ukraine, if it's going to retain its independence, to be Austrian-like. And I think there are people ready to accept that in Europe. The sticking point, of course, is London and Washington. There, There's no willingness at this point to compromise. However, I suspect that Moscow anticipates that might change after the election, regardless of whomever is elected. So I think the real bad news, the, the real danger point is in the Middle East now much less the case in Ukraine. And uh, I think there's a healthy respect for the hypersonic missile arsenal that the Russians have and the enormous damage they can inflict. You know, you're talking about missiles flying somewhere between 4,500 miles an hour to six or 7,000 miles per hour, carrying enormous warheads, 1,500, 1,700, 2,000 pounds. And of course, when you move at that speed, the impact of the of the warhead is that much greater than it otherwise would be. So you're seeing detonations that look to the human eye as being essentially nuclear, but they're not. No nuclear weapons have been used, and I don't think any will be used in Europe. On the other hand, the, the Iran, excuse me, the Israelis have nuclear weapons. And I don't think we can rule out the potential use of those weapons depending on the circumstances. So that, that's, again, the, you have two very different situations. And I think the Middle Eastern one is far more dangerous to us right now than what's happening in eastern Ukraine. That does not mean that it could not change quickly if someone does something exceedingly stupid. And one of the things that people do worry about, I think, in Washington, as well as Moscow, is the sort of outside possibility that some stupid thing is done by the Ukrainians over and above and in spite of any guidance or wishes we may express. But barring that, I, I think the war in Ukraine has a good chance of coming to an end by the end of the year, simply because of all the events that I mentioned, changes in Europe, changes in Ukraine, and the advance of Russian forces. The real question is, how do we avoid a larger conflagration at this point in the Middle East? And as you pointed out at the beginning, that looks less and less avoidable. Well, it certainly looks like the, the front line continues to crumble. It's been doing it for a while, but it appears to intensify. There's a lot of eyes, of course, on Pokrovsk, but as we've seen over the past uh, two days, 
Uh, Vugledar is also falling apart, Chassiviar, and the thing is, after especially Pokrovsk and Chassiviar, there's not much fortifications anymore once you start going west. So, uh, so with the economic problems, uh, the the manpower problem, running out of weapons, also the inability of the west to send any, it doesn't seem that there's many ways to uh, push back anymore besides escalating with these uh, efforts to take the war into Russia. Uh, which there has been some enthusiasm to do, but uh, we saw with Kursk, this uh, yeah. has been a spectacular failure, and uh, or, or even these attacks on the weapon depots. It's uh, it seems very it's hard to imagine that this was pulled off by the Ukrainians alone. As you said, obviously they had some assistance with uh, circumventing uh, where the yeah. heavy radar was, but. Well, the Russians have a, a number of these, uh, a large number of these munitions storage areas. Uh, I think the Ukrainians, thanks to our intervention, the use of our ISR, space-based intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, got lucky in Tver. But I don't think that uh, we should expect much of that in the future. And I know that, for instance, the air, to air and missile defense coverage has already been adjusted uh, to ensure that something like this is not repeated. But I think your point is is very valid. The, the, the electrical grid is essentially destroyed. The logistical infrastructure to sustain and supply the forces in eastern Ukraine is gone. So it's over for all intents and purposes. And, you know, frankly, this war was lost a long time ago. But we're now up to, what, 600,000 dead Ukrainian soldiers. I don't know how many civilians. But that's an enormous number. That's World War I level of casualties. That compares favorably to three years on the Western Front between France, Britain, and uh, and Germany, or for that matter, even in the Eastern Front against Russia at that time. It's catastrophic. And then again, we still have all the various interested parties that can't wait to move into Ukraine, like back BlackRock and others, to gain control of the place. Uh, and I don't know how that turns out. I hope that the Europeans wake up and understand that this is Europe, not the United States, and that they have a, a long-term investment in stability and peace in Europe. And that means in Ukraine and what, what occurs in the aftermath of this war. They're going to have to take charge. I think they've, they've been in that position for a long time. Washington is simply not capable of launching any new initiative until after the election. Well, it appears that the, the British are really the last ones who are very extremely uh, yeah, more enthusiastic still in Ukraine. Because as you mentioned before, the Germans appear to be uh, becoming more and more uh, wary of this whole thing, especially as their economy continues to tank. And even Macron was making uh, a point uh, the other day that uh, uh, at some point we have to address that Russia is a country in Europe and uh, Europe isn't simply NATO uh, a lesson, of course, we could have had a few years ago that uh, uh, simply uh, rolling a military alliance closer and closer to the Russian border, that this wasn't necessarily a good recipe for security. But but uh, there seems to be, uh, I want to ask about the if you see there's any possibility of uh, the United States possibly retiring uh, Zelensky, because a few months ago you had this spat between Solushny and Zelensky. Uh, General Solushny was you know, sent to London to be ambassador. But now as the Americans and British return to, well, their leaders come to Kiev, they appear to have brought Solushny with them. He becomes more vocal. He's appearing in the media. He's openly criticizing uh, the Kursk uh, adventure, which is now being pinned solely on Zelensky. So do, do you think there's any uh, chance that uh, there might be uh, yeah, looking for someone else to take over the uh, the lead in Ukraine, or would this be well, too the people we should ask for that answer are in the CIA and MI6 in London because they're effectively running the show, and they've been running the thing almost from the beginning. So I I don't know is the easiest answer. It's certainly possible, and there are people that have talked behind the scenes about this sort of thing because I think there's a growing recognition that we need to get out of this. That's true in Washington. It's true in much of Europe. But again, who takes the initiative? Who steps forward? It's, it's as though you're, you're there for, you're sitting at the dining table and you've got this sort of pile of garbage in the center of the table. And everybody knows it's garbage, 
and you can't eat until you get rid of the garbage, but no one wants to stand up and remove the garbage. Uh, it's an embarrassing moment. And so I, I don't have an answer, but I think something has to happen. And we've been down this road before. Unfortunately, we have also frequently picked the wrong people uh, to step in and take over and then ended up in a worse position than we were to begin with. That was certainly true in Vietnam. There are people that would argue we've been through something similar in Central America. Bottom line is we'll have to wait and see. But clearly, after the election, regardless of whomever wins, I think there will be an appetite to bring the disaster to a close in Eastern Europe. I think that's quite clear. The larger question is, what do you do about the Middle East? And right now, as I've said before, uh, Mr. Netanyahu exerts far more power and influence over the Congress of the United States than anybody in the United States. And he is, has got the U.S. Armed Forces literally at his beck and call. He just has to pick the right moment and have the right trigger to bring them in. And there are a lot of people in Washington that also want to draw down some of the forces in Eastern Europe. We've got a lot of troops over there strung out, and they're not exactly in a good posture from the standpoint of either defense or offense. So I, you know, I think we're ready for a change, but I think the change is most likely to come in Eastern Europe, not the Middle East. Yeah, but there's all these <clears throat> different priorities, uh, uh, and I guess, for, well, from my perspective, this was one of the curses of the uh, hegemonic era from the 1990s. Is when one is all powerful, there's a lack of priorities being made. If you if if one is going to do everything. And uh, it, uh, I guess I have a question about the capabilities because uh, obviously the United States would like to, um, well, have a final say over what happens in Ukraine, but it also wants to uh, resolve this issue in uh, the Middle East, which I'm not sure how, how could be done. And of course, pulling all of this off and still moving towards uh, countering China. So I'm, I'm just curious, well, how do you see the capabilities on, on the American side? Uh, in terms remember, of the remember there is no, troops and equipment. Yeah, but Glenn, there is no strategy. You know, when you when you think that your resources are limitless and your power is unconstrained, why would you need a strategy? So you simply draw up a wish list and say, I wish these things to happen. We've been doing this for almost 30 years. I mean, look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan. Look at Syria. Look at look at Libya. Uh, you know, look at the Balkans. We we simply had a, a wish list. We want it to look this way, and then we thought that we could wish it into existence simply on the basis of the power at our disposal. Well, it hasn't worked very well, and the power that we once had is vanishing. And this is the other part of it. You're talking about equipment and troops. I mean, obviously, we've got serious problems with regard to the American military establishment right now, and it's. It's a mystery to people overseas, but it's very real here. We can't get people to join it. And uh, we've got a serious morale problem. And we have perhaps the weakest, least competent military leadership that I think we've ever had in our history. Uh, the people that we're dealing with are as delusional about our capabilities and what we can do as the political figures that appointed them. So it's a, it's a terrible situation to be in. And we forget that your number one principle and strategy is to maintain your national power. We've been pissing it away, to be blunt. Our national power is ebbing. Uh, it is not increasing. It's weakening. This is not just stocks of equipment and stocks of munitions. The nation itself has weakened as a consequence of our behavior over the last 30 years. We are facing some sort of financial crisis that's going to have an impact. I don't know when it strikes, but everyone knows it's coming. Uh, we just haven't, haven't been able to pinpoint exactly when this house of cards that we built on debt and debt finance consumption crumbles, but it's going to crumble. And to this has to be added the fact that you have these open borders and millions of people who poured into the country about whom we know nothing. I mean, the latest latest estimates are that at least 52 million people living inside the United States were not born in this country. Probably more. Well, how do you hold a society together under those circumstances, particularly when you're promising everybody everything for nothing, including 
people that just arrived who are not citizens, many of whom don't speak English, a lot of whom cannot be employed. Uh, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a serious crisis because our own population is struggling. You know, the concentration of wealth in the United States is at the upper end. More wealth is concentrated in the top three to four percent of the population than ever in its history. And we've had these concentrations before, but not on this scale. And we've never had a wealthy class as remote from the rest of the public as this class is. And for that matter, you have a, a political system that is shaped entirely by donors. Policy is made by donors. And if you want to survive and be successful in Washington and leave as a multimillionaire, you pay attention to donors. And that's what we've got. We have a donor-dominated government. So the republic itself is on very, very feeble ground. I remember, this was a key argument in the 90s against the so-called hegemonic peace, uh, that uh, mm -hmm. it would be too expensive, uh, overstretched as it was. So... Uh, and this would lead to yeah, social, economic, and political uh, decline if it was pursued uh, domestically, while externally it would incentivize other great powers to ally or to, at least to counterbalance uh, the United States. And uh, yeah, next month we see the BRICS meeting again in uh, Kazan to essentially <laughs> discuss how to become less reliant on the United States and create alternatives. So it seems as if uh, the, the wider strategy should be discussed in terms of not just the United States, but the collective West, what, uh, how we can adjust to the new world. But um, I had a question. I probably will regret it, given you just gave a very negative overview of the absence of exit strategies over the past 30 years. But uh, what, what are the possible ways out uh, or peace settlements in uh, both in the Middle East as well as with uh, Ukraine, given that, uh, well, so far we haven't taken any of the opportunities. But if, if if there will be an opportunity to resolve this somehow, a diplomatic solution, what what might it look like? I think a diplomatic solution, if one is crafted at all, will have to be crafted by the Europeans and the Russians. Now, when I say Europeans, I suspect that that will involve some of Russia's neighbors. <clears throat> will certainly have to involve Berlin. I don't think we can craft a solution. We have no credibility whatsoever in Moscow. We've lied to them about everything imaginable over the last 30 years. <clears throat> Why would they listen to us at all? I think what will happen is at some point we will simply suspend all further military aid to Ukraine. That will, that will simply come to an end. Then the next step will be to withdraw all U.S. personnel in other words, citizens and soldiers, everyone who's on the ground, get out. Uh, that will happen. Now, when will that happen? That could happen after the election, depending upon who wins, because of the recognition that we simply can't afford to sustain, you know, this, this uh, throwing of money into a, a bottomless pit with no return on the investment. But, you know, people always ask, when did the British leave India? Well, they left India after World War II when they were effectively financially broken, and their debt-to-GDP ratio was 240%. I think that's what we're facing now, something similar in the on the U.S. side. So it's not going to be a consequence of some seriously considered analytical framework that is embraced for a diplomatic solution. We'll just get out, recognizing that we really can't influence what happens next. Now, the Middle East is a little different, but that's what I think will happen in uh, in Eastern Europe. The Middle East is a, is a place you can't predict because we don't know what losses we may sustain down there. Uh, we, we have a lot of forces that are potentially in harm's way. Uh, if we begin to lose forces, whether they're on the ground, I talked about the soldiers that are on the ground, or it happens at sea, there are going to be some hard questions asked back in the United States. There's a big difference between losing 10 or 12 people every other week and losing perhaps a thousand or more in a day. Uh, that's what we've learned historically. So I, I don't know that uh, the Middle Eastern thing will come to a close as a result of some wisely crafted strategy either. <clears throat> 
uh, it's very difficult to walk in at the end of an open-ended conflict when you've had no real strategy and your end state was never achievable. In other words, it was unrealistic. And then trying to find a way out. Politicians all have difficulty retreating from outrageous statements. And we have politicians that have made outrageous statements. So do the Germans. So do the French. So do the British. So of yours all made ridiculous statements that could never, ever be realized in practice. How did they stand up and say, oh, I guess we were wrong. Nobody does that. So the predisposition will be to change the subject and walk away. I think that's what Americans will do. What did we do at the end of the Vietnam era? We left. We changed the subject. It vanished from the television screens. And see, the, the thing that's so interesting right now is that the disasters that we're discussing are almost invisible to most Americans. I, I'm not sure how many Europeans are aware of how disastrous these things are. I don't know what finds its way through the mainstream media, but in the United States, you have to turn to what we call alternative media for real information because you're not going to get it to the mainstream. And that's risky because if Americans are completely unprepared for a real disaster, they're not likely to react very positively. And that, I think, is something Washington ought to worry about. But they aren't at this stage. They're, they're absolutely not. I couldn't agree more. I think the absence of uh, proper media coverage is one of the main reasons why we haven't had any course correction. At least here, the media still talks about how uh, Ukraine can win if we only you know, allow them to hit uh, the Russia uh, you know, seemingly us having no role in this. Uh, but I find the, the suggestions for peace coming out uh, from the West to be a bit strange because they're always based on the idea that let's escalate a little bit more so we pressure, uh, you know, the Russians to sit down. But it feels as if on, at the most they will accept a ceasefire along the current uh, lines but without recognizing any territorial uh, concessions uh, but it, it, I don't see how the Russians would uh, accept any of this. As you mentioned, we lie to them a lot. And uh, the Minsk agreement, of course, is a key one. We just bought seven years for uh, arming Ukraine, which we admitted later on, instead of actually implementing the peace. So uh, I, I can't imagine the Russians accepting any ceasefire if uh, this is seen as simply buying time, rearming Ukraine to fight another day. So... Uh, so would it be the threat of losing more territory that would have compelled them to sit down? Or do you see any possible uh, others taking power in Kyiv? But even if this is the case, you're still going to have the nationalists which won't accept any uh, you know, compromise with the Russians. And it just seems um, the, the only solution now will probably be a very ugly, a very ugly victory for the Russians in which uh, they essentially take what they need of uh, Ukrainian territory in order for it not to be used as an effective uh, uh, front line against the Russians by NATO later on. But uh, it's yeah, it's, uh, it's very hard to <laughs> imagine what a peace would look like, I guess. Well, I, I think the Russians you know, could conceivably combine a couple of things to get a better outcome. One is new governments in Europe, particularly in Berlin, uh, and I think somebody like Maloney down in uh, Italy privately knows that uh, sustaining this war makes no sense at all. Uh, she's taken some very decisive steps in the direction of protecting Italy from these massive invasions from North Africa and the Middle East. And I think that's a very positive step. I think Italy is pointing, pointing a, a, the way forward for much of Europe. I think she and uh, the Germans are very definitely going to step forward at some point once you get a new government in Berlin and end the end of stupidity. Now, that that's half of the equation. The other half is the Russian. Could the Russians put together a, a Ukrainian government consisting of Ukrainians who are not hostile to Russia? Well, I think it's possible, yes. And there may be Ukrainians out there that recognize the futility of unending uh, hostility. Not everyone in Ukraine is crazy. Uh, there are balanced and thoughtful people in Ukraine. They're certainly not going to come to the fore with Zelensky and his crew running the show in uh, Kiev. So 
you know, what, what will the Russians do? I think they'll look for a combination of what I just described, an Austrianized rump Ukraine, whatever that rump Ukraine turns out to look like, with a new government, with new people in it that have backing both from Moscow and potentially from European leadership. Uh, that's the most prudent, I think, way forward at this stage. Again, I just don't see us contributing positively. Uh, it's to, it asks us to admit to failure, and we are just disinclined to do that. We're, we're much more likely to turn our attention instead to the Middle East and continue to make that place into a mess uh, because I don't see us exercising any any restraining influence over Netanyahu at this stage. Yeah, well, it's, um, it just seems difficult to walk away from Ukraine because it's not even from 2014. It's important to remember that it's now 20 years ago since the Orange Revolution in 2004, and uh, in which we tried to pull Ukraine into the NATO orbit. But then when the Ukrainians were allowed to vote, as we saw in 2010, they voted in Yanukovych. Uh, but then, of course, we got rid of him in 2014. So we've been playing this game for a very long time. It just doesn't... It seems well difficult to imagine that we're willing to walk away completely from this uh, project Ukraine. Um, however, yeah, one final question: uh, How do you see um, the future now of NATO? Because uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg just gave his farewell speech, and uh, he <laughs> he summarized you know his own great achievements and the achievements of NATO uh, effectively. It's also quite interesting because he didn't refer anything to the security competition or how actually anything would enhance security. Instead, uh, achievements was effectively that we now have thousands of troops on the eastern flank uh, on the Russian border. We have uh, many more NATO member states, uh, um, well, members who have joined NATO, and uh, uh, we're spending more on military force, and we're going to mm -hmm. now also go into Asia because we shouldn't make the mistakes we did with Russia, with China. We have to be firm. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, like, it's, it's almost like a war declaration. At no point did it explain that perhaps uh, more weapons doesn't always produce more peace. But uh, my, my, my question is more within NATO, because you see now, uh, obviously, the, the pressure against Hungary and Slovakia. You see the Italians starting to push a bit back. Uh, the, the tensions between the Germans and the Poles, uh, the US and Turkey... Uh, resentment within the EU and then of course within the countries as you mentioned the elections now undergoing in Germany shows that they were sick of the government uh, France itself uh, interestingly Macron you know they came in third in the election but they were able first to push out the right now they're pushing out the left and they're going to continue so as if there was no election at all uh, things seem to be getting more and more chaotic so uh, do, you, do you share Stoltenberg's <laughs> optimism or do you see this uh, this greatness of NATO to uh, falter over the next few years. I think Stoltenberg is uh, waving goodbye from the stern of the Titanic. Uh, NATO is finished. It's a, not a question of whether it will crumble and vanish. It's a question of when. All of the forces that you just described are going to tear it to pieces. Uh, I was on talking very recently to people in the Balkans. Croatia, Slovenia, uh, and they want nothing to do with this war on Russia. You know, this is simply outrageous nonsense. They're very uncomfortable with the NATO treaty that is being interpreted in a way that suggests that they have to be drawn into a war that they don't want and don't support. So I think NATO's day is almost over. The question is, what do you replace it with? And maybe there will be an attempt to try and resuscitate some form of it for a while, but ultimately, you're going to have to come up with a new solution. Because again, there's this underlying supposition that we stay in perpetuity, and I don't think that's realistic. I think the uh, financial constraints uh, in the United States, you, you talked about overstretch. And I remember Paul Kennedy, uh, in his famous book about the rise and fall of great powers, made it very clear that overstretch was usually self-inflicted. You know, the old adage that empires do not die by through conquest, they die through suicide. And we've effectively shot ourselves in the foot so many times, financially, economically, diplomatically, and now militarily, that I don't think it's reasonable to expect us to remain the dominant force uh, militarily in NATO any longer. 
you already pointed to Turkey, and we haven't even talked about the BRICS. You mentioned it briefly, but it's more than just an alternative. You're talking about an, a parallel financial system, one that has the potential in time to eclipse the financial system that we set up after the Second World War. People are no longer willing to live inside a financial system where we bully everyone. We control the IMF. We control the World Bank. We determine who receives what in terms of money. We're dictating to people what they're going to mine, what they're going to sell, what kinds of crops they're going to grow. All of this has to go away. And you have Russia, India, China, Saudi Arabia, Brazil. What are they saying? Come join us. We're not going to tell you to do anything except trade. We want you to trade. We're not setting up any barriers. We're not planning on sanctioning anybody. No one is going to be punished. Simply join, and we will all prosper together. Well, what a wonderful idea. How, how can we possibly compete with that? Because everything that we do is always laced with all these uh, implied or stated threats. You know, you have to meet our standard, whatever it is, in human rights or elections or something else, all the while that we ourselves are living in this very transparent glass house where we are not living up to the very ideals that we're telling everybody else they must adopt. So I think it's over. I don't know when, but it's over. And I thought this was the case in January of 2022. In fact, I was on uh, in a discussion with Dimitri Symes at the National Interest, and uh, this was ultimately televised. And he said, what do you think the long-term outcome is? I said, if we uh, engage in direct conflict, either through our proxy or otherwise with Russia, this will be the end of NATO. NATO will not survive this crisis. I think that's where we're headed. Now, if you're a Russian, that's a double-edged sword. Because on the one side, you don't like NATO, but it's one of these situations where at least you know what you're dealing with. You know that somebody's in charge. If NATO vanishes and collapses and the Americans withdraw, what's left over? That's a big question. Who are you going to deal with? You know, we just don't know. I don't think the Europeans know. Uh, the once and future king of Europe is in ruins. The once and future king of Europe is Germany. So we destroyed it through two world wars, but it turns out that the last 80 years were necessary to utterly ruin it to the point where Germans spend all of their time hating themselves, loathing themselves, and committing suicide. Uh, so you can't expect much out of Germany, at least in the short run. So where do we go? I, I don't think anybody knows. Yeah, I know you said on many occasions you wished uh, Europeans would uh, take more responsibility for its own security. But uh, on the other hand, it looks now that the Europeans are eager to attack Russia. It's the Americans which appears to be uh, pushing back. So I'm not sure if the Europeans are quite ready yet. But uh, just on a final note, it's uh, I think the Turkey, NATO member Turkey, one of the biggest militaries uh, now wanting to join BRICS is a good uh, well symbol of... Uh, yeah, I guess what's to come. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyways, I, I'm afraid we yeah, went over a bit over time, but uh, thank you so much, Colonel. It's always uh, very interesting to pick your brain. Yeah, thanks again. Hey, thank you, Glenn. My best to everybody.